Okay, so we'll jump in. Welcome everyone to Land, Love, and Willful Refusals, Disrupting Settler Colonization from Turtle Island to Palestine with Drs. Kim Talbear and Lara Shihai. My name is Tobias Wiggins. I'm an assistant professor in Women's and Gender Studies at Athabasca University, and I'll be moderating today's event along with my colleagues and co-organizers of the J series, Suzanne McCullough, Assistant Professor in Philosophy, Nina Palovikova, Associate Professor in History, and Priscilla McGreer, our Graduate Research Assistant. We are joined by our ASL interpreters, Anise and Heather, who will be available on screen for this uh, presentation. If you require assistance accessing interpretation, or if you have other specific accessibility needs, uh, please reach out to Nina Palovikova through the Zoom chat function, and we'll do our best to assist you. The Justice Webinar and Speaker Series, we also call it J-Series, hosts online events with scholars who address topics pertaining to social and transformative justice, anti-oppression, and equity. The primary goal of the J-Series is to increase capacities for justice broadly conceived throughout our communities, research initiatives, and teaching praxis. And we have a bunch of social media. You can follow us. Uh, we're building more of it, but right now we have Facebook. We have an Eventbrite. And a few of our uh, previous talks have been recorded and posted there. We just finished editing uh, the Slowing Research talk. If you missed it, please check it out and we'll share it all in the chat. I really wanna extend our gratitude for the support of Athabasca University Faculty of Humanities and Social Science, without which these events couldn't take place. We're thankful for our foundational conversations with Maria Campbell, Priscilla Campo, and Ivy Lalond of Nascatuan, which is the Indigenous Center at Athabasca University. The visions and actions outlined in Niskatwin and the Niskatwin plan drive our commitment to sharing Indigenous knowledge in respectful, responsive, reflective, and reciprocal ways. I also want to extend a special thank you to the Reich Center for Architecture's Global Studio for their ongoing support and our continued collaborations. So a few final housekeeping comments. We uh, want to ask participants to keep their cameras off and mute themselves for this presentation. The chat function is turned off for this event, but you can message uh, the, the hosts and co-hosts. So if you have questions for our speakers, uh, we really encourage you to send a direct message to the RA, our RA Priscilla, Priscilla McGreer. So you can just click the drop down and, and send a message to Priscilla at any time during this talk. So we're going to be collecting those comments, that those questions, and then we're going to draw from them at the end uh, during the Q&A portion. And I'll remind folks about that throughout the chat or throughout the talk. And now I'd like to pass it over uh, to Suzanne and uh, the whole J-Series team is going to come on the screen and we'll offer a land acknowledgement. Thank you, Tobias. Uh, so we want to start by acknowledging that the land upon which many members of the Athabasca University community live are home to 48 First Nations and eight Métis settlements. This land, also known as Alberta, Canada, is mostly covered by Treaty 6, 7, and 8, which include the traditional territories of the Nehiao, Dene, Anishinaabe, Soto, Nakota Sioux, Haudenosaunee, Sutena, Chikinik, Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations, the Blackfoot Confederacy, which includes Gana, Bigani, and Sigsika peoples. We want to name that the intention of the treaties is to establish and maintain respectful relations between Indigenous peoples and the Crown, and that these treaties have not been honored due to Canada's violation of Indigenous rights. That said, we understand that we all have responsibilities to upholding the true intent of the treaties. These include, but are not limited to, 
sharing resources, respecting and amplifying indigenous ways of knowing, fostering and maintaining good relations, and holding governments and institutions accountable to their treaty responsibilities. I'll pass it over to Nina, we'll say a few more words. Many of us know of the complacency that sometimes accompanies institutional settlement acknowledgements, that they can act only as a recited script, seeking a single check mark. With these logics in mind, the JCRS team has been in continued discussion about how we might move beyond land acknowledgements towards our decolonial commitments. Uh, or put another way, uh, the actions we take that might, for example, to contribute to dismantling, uh, dismantling continued colonization or help us move towards conciliation. We say conciliation rather than reconciliation on reflection of shared wisdom from Nexcatavin. We acknowledge that there is no good relationship to return to. We must establish good relations now to stop the centuries long inestimably destructive abuse of people and the land. To foster transparency, accountability, and collective knowledge, the J series team wanted to share a piece of our process. Together, we are actively working towards building a series of collective commitments that will continue to deeply inform our event organizing. We know that we are committed to centering indigenous voices and spotlighting decolonial scholarship, relationship building, and activisms. Our next steps are guided by a series of questions. How does J-Series foster good relations and responsibility to the land, water, and non-human beings? How do we promote institutional accountability and support the university's capacity to fulfill their obligations towards indigenous communities? What does it mean to be to build authentic relationships with indigenous communities and take concrete actions of solidarity. To what extent does J series engage with indigenous protocols? How might we best commit to financially supporting indigenous led organizations, especially those within the communities where we live? We are grateful for this opportunity to share and invite any thoughts, collaborations and feedback which can be sent to our email available in the chat. Now I'm passing word to Tobias and Priscilla. Since we're all calling in from different areas, we're gonna uh, take a few moments uh, intentionally now, if it feels right to you, to collectively turn inwards and consider the land that you're on, wherever you're calling in from. If you'd like to participate in this, you may want to just take a second to notice where you're sitting. You may want to find a more comfortable seat, maybe adjust. You could stand up if you wanted or even relax back. Just noticing how the ground feels under you. For this, it might feel good to have your eyes open or closed. If your camera's on, um, you might want to turn it off and you might want to leave it on. And you may just take a second to turn your attention to your breath. It might feel good to notice its rhythm. It could feel good and grounding perhaps to explore one deeper in-breath and perhaps a longer exhale. And as you notice where your body is touching the ground and you find yourself in the space that you're in, perhaps connecting to your breath and the ground beneath you, we're just going to offer a few guiding reflections. As you focus on your breath, resting on land of ancient memory, you may think about the indigenous peoples of the land that you're on, some of the names you have heard, and there are more to learn. <laughs> 
you may take a moment to honor the land and its host of human and non-human beings, as well as the keepers of the land that sustains each of us. Perhaps you turn your thinking to your own commitments to decolonization and to our communities. I wanna thank everyone uh, for listening and participating in whatever way felt right for you. It is now my pleasure and honor to introduce our distinguished speakers. And I don't know, am I spotlighted still? I think I'm still, I think something has happened. Oh, okay, maybe it's just my view is a bit weird. I will continue. So I'm happy to introduce Kim Talbear. So Kim Talbear, Sisseton Wapatan Oyate, she, her, is Professor and Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Peoples, Technoscience and Society, Faculty of Native Studies, University of Alberta. She is the author of Native American DNA, Tribal Belonging, and The False Promise of Genetic Science. In addition to studying genome science disruptions to Indigenous self-definitions, Dr. Talbear studies colonial disruptions to Indigenous sexual relations. She is a regular panelist on the weekly podcast, Media Indigenous, and you can follow her research group at IndigenousSTS.com. She tweets at Kim Talbear. You can also follow her monthly posts on her sub track newsletter, Unsettle Indigenous Affairs, Cultural Politics, and Decolonization. And then Laura Shihai, she, her, is an assistant professor of clinical psychology at George Washington University's professional psychology program, where she is the founding faculty director of the Psychoanalysis and the Arab World Lab. Lara's work takes up decolonial and anti-oppressive approaches to psychoanalysis with a focus on liberation struggles in the global South. She is co-author with Stefan Shiha of Psychoanalysis Under Occupation, Practicing Resistance in Palestine, which came out Rutledge 2022, which recently won the Middle East Monitors Palestine Book Award for Best Academic Book. Lara is President of the Society for Psychoanalysis and Psychoanalytic Psychology, the Chair of the Teachers Academy of the American Psychoanalytic Association, and co-editor of Studies in Gender and Sexuality and Counterspace in Psychoanalysis, Culture, and Society. Lara is also a contributing editor to the Psychosocial Foundation's Parapraxis magazine and on the advisory board for the USA Palestine Mental Health Network and Psychoanalysis for Pride. So I'm very excited uh, to start us off by turning it over to Dr. Shihai. Um, pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Tobias. مرحبا للكل اهلا وسهلا بالجميع وشكرا لوجودكم معنا اليوم I just want to say thank you of course Athabasca University the J series Tobias um my dear friend especially and then Suzanne Nina and Priscilla as well for being so generous with your time also our interpreters Anisa and Heather and everyone who made uh whose labor made this possible so much goes into these things and we really appreciate it and also thank you, Kim, uh, for being in conversation with me today, as I'm sure others are. I'm totally fangirling over here, so I'm really happy and excited to hear you speak. Um, I want to also say a special thank you to my partner, Stephen, uh, who's my partner in every way, but specifically to my talk today. He's my writing partner and the person who sustains 
my militancy. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the land acknowledgement. I, I'd like to take just a moment to locate myself. I'm beaming in from the stolen land of the Pamunkey people in the settler colony of the United States. My naming this is important, uh, not only because I'm an immigrant child who received settler colonial citizenship of what is now known as Canada, and not only because we're discussing Palestine and the settler colonial condition under which Palestinians live, but also as my own commitment to the disruption of psychic disavowals that happen to allow us to live under conditions that split off the material reality, past and present, of indigenous life in settler situations from Turtle Island to Palestine. In saying this, I also want to be clear that when I talk about decoloniality or decolonization, I'm committed to land back efforts and all forms of indigenous sovereignty as determined by indigenous people the world over. <clears throat> I wanna also locate us in this particular moment. I'm speaking to you as the settler apartheid state of Israel is in the process of forcibly displacing over a thousand people and continuing land grabbing, this time of Masafariata, as well as continuing its ongoing genocidal policies towards Palestinians with specific intent to maim and kill children, especially to ensure settler futures. What we speak about today then is happening in the present, as readily in Turtle Island as it is in Palestine, making it the more urgent for us to take it up. So I really appreciate all of you being here today in, in a metaphoric, but also a real locked arms against settler colonialism. So I'll, I'll start my official <laughs> talk. Um, in Can the Monster Speak, Paul Preciado punctuates his rousing call to psychoanalysis. And this is a quote. He says, my mission is the revenge of the psychoanalytic and psychiatric object in equal measure over the institutional, clinical, and micropolitical systems that shore up the violence wreaked by the sexual, gender, and racial norms. We urgently need clinical practice to transition. This cannot happen without a revolutionary mutation in psychoanalysis and a critical challenge of its patriarchal colonial presuppositions." End quote. The work showcased in my co-authored book, Psychoanalysis Under Occupation, is an account of one such revolutionary mutation occurring in real time across Palestine Palestine by Palestinian clinicians. To map out this mutation, my partner and co-author Stephen and I engage in a decolonial feminist solidarity building approach to work alongside our Palestinian colleagues, not as they are or were interpolated by and through settler colonial logic or what Francoise Vergez terms civilizational feminism, but rather, and very pertinent to today's event, through what Sarah Ahmad alerts us to, Palestinians as willful subjects. And that's the sort of through line, the willful subjectivity of indigenous people here, specifically Palestinians. Heeding Ahmad, we saw in Palestine that, quote, this is Ahmad's words, willfulness is a diagnosis of the failure to comply with those whose authority is given and involves persistence in the face of having been brought down, end quote. It is not coincidental that a decolonial feminist style of politics guided our book. Decolonial feminist and queer methodologies and positions that affirm that cis-heteronormative patriarchal structures, including all forms of capitalism, colonialism, and settler colonialism are the problem. And also that these structures routinely identify willfulness as a problem. In Palestine, we were invited into a world where Palestinian clinicians, comrades and colleagues reclaimed the concept of problem, asserting themselves daily as defiant, unassimilatable problems engaging in acts of refusal 
that alerted us to their willful self-affirmation of material reality individually and communally as indigenous to the land of Palestine. In this way, they, as Nadira Shalhoub Kavrukian notes, quote, speak life and speak Palestine and insist on the power of livability. This willfulness is produced and reproduced individually and therapeutically through clinical practice and the ways in which it embodies itself in the social practices of the political, social, collective, and individual ethos of sumud, very roughly translated stalwartness. It's one of these beautiful Arabic words that has no translation, which I'm actually very happy about. <laughs> Palestinian clinicians in turn produce, reproduce, and support sumud of their patients, their colleagues, families, and communities. Sumud does not only reify communal bonds, but also works against neoliberal demands of individuality or psychoanalytic theories that act as arbiters of an ableist notion of health and wellness. Here, sumud emerges as the space whereby Palestinian clinicians and their patients together forge spaces of livability despite the ever increasing chokeholds, to take Poir's words, that are constitutive of the Zionist settler colonial regime. Most importantly, as a socio psychic practice built into clinical practice, we learn that Sumud, just as in the street and home, is not stagnantly working towards sort of settler notions of resilience, but rather is a practice of liberation, a willful practice of liberation. Our Palestinian colleagues highlighted the process by which they've been forging clinical networks, self-sustained clinics and workshops, and an ethics of care, what we call the Palestinian psychotherapeutic commons or an indigenous Palestinian psychoanalytic praxis. One particular case shared by our comrade and friend, a revolutionary feminist clinician, Yuad Ranadri Hakim, this case stays with me. And every time I return to it, it affects me. And I'm, I'm hoping to share that with you today. The case was with her work with Amjad, a man in his early 30s who worked in an Israeli textile company inside what is now considered the 1948 borders of the state now known as Israel. Though he had a home in the West Bank, Amjad, along with his three children and his wife, who was a homemaker, rented a house in an officially annexed village near Kalandia out of fear of losing his identity card. And of course here, identity cards mean something very specific when we're talking about indigenous histories in particular in the settler state of Canada too. This identity card allowed him to live and work in Jerusalem. Amjad visited the clinic where Yoad worked as he suffered from sensations of a lump or a ball in his throat whenever he became nervous. Amjad's therapy with Yoad lasted about one and a half years of weekly sessions, initially supervised by an Israeli Jewish psychologist. Yad often sensed a collapse of what she called psychic space when her Israeli supervisor, rather than being curious about the psychoanalytic meanings of Amjad's symptoms, insisted that Amjad suffered from an anxiety disorder only and that medication would be the only way to fix his problem. She had the sense that the, the supervisor was suggesting that Amjad had no interiority. Yoad felt deeply conflicted by this assessment as she relayed her gut feeling, or what we might read as a tuned clinical intuition, that Amjad likely had much more to say. She feared that medicine, while could be helpful, could also potentially preemptively shut Amjad, his exploratory, and their collaborative process down. Yad insisted that she, could, she should continue to be curious with Amjad about what he was trying to communicate in the displacement, not directly, in the counter-transferential space, what he brought up in her, and in the dyad together. She was attentive 
to the systemic meanings of his symptoms, especially under settler colonial occupation. Despite her supervisor's resistance, Yaad worked with Amjad to uncover and recount all the moments in which he had felt suffocated by the ball. When his wife reminded him of payments for the quote, pathetic car he had bought, when he passed in front of his closed house in the West Bank, when his Israeli boss asked him to bring him fresh olive oil from their tree in the West Bank, when he entered the area controlled by the Palestinian Authority, another part of his own country, and he read the sign, no crossing border, dangerous area. When Amjad started to breathe better, Yaad's supervisor indicated that it abruptly, that it was time for Yaad to terminate Amjad's treatment because the supervisor felt there was no further growth or depth to explore. Yaad initially followed her supervisor's advice and told Amjad they needed to move to termination of their treatment, at which point Yaad shared with us, Amjad exploded, telling her she was weak and that she was, quote, not the one who owns the decision or the decision-making process, telling her that she was, quote, not really concerned with taking care of and protecting sick people. End quote. Yuad remembers being initially shocked, but internally very happy at the outburst, which allowed her to make the decision to continue Amjad's treatment alone without consulting her supervisor any further. During this phase of their treatment, Amjad started talking about anger. More specifically, he spoke about getting angry inside his car, the lousy car in which he crossed the Kalandia checkpoint twice a day, once on his way to work and once on his way back. Amjad reported getting angry in his car when he read the word Mabar, translated checkpoint crossing on a sign. He reported feeling anger because he did not feel like he was just crossing innocently from one area to another, but instead he felt he was inside one space, but prohibited from free movement in another while standing at an unnatural checkpoint. This is Amjad speaking. Why do they call it a crossing? This is a checkpoint, a hajiz. It's a checkpoint, a checkpoint. In a session soon after he, he began to uncover his anger, Yad reminded him that they'd not spoken about the ball in his throat for quite some time now, inquiring where it was and if it remained a symptom for him. Amjad said, sometimes I feel that there is hate or hatefulness in my throat and not a ball. This is when Yad decided to ask him who he hated to which he responded, I hate myself. After a moment of silence, Yad said Amjad opened up about an incident that had happened two years prior. He reported taking his seven-year-old daughter in the morning with him on his way to work as she had wanted to meet with a friend in Jerusalem. He remembered that his daughter was very happy that morning as she'd been fantasizing about this magical day with her friend for quite some time. He recalled that she wore a beautiful new dress and had put flowers in her hair. Amjad further shared that his daughter was singing throughout the trip in the car, her song, bouncy, bouncy, bouncy ball, bouncy, bouncy over the wall. When they, re when they reached the Kalandia checkpoint, Amjad was surprised to see tear gas and a confrontation between the occupying forces and protesters. Worried about his daughter, he tried to reverse, but his car was stuck in the midst of hundreds of cars, all trapped, motionless. After 15 minutes, the occupation soldiers closed the checkpoint and prevented the cars from moving, all the while Amjad hugged his daughter, who had begun to cry uncontrollably trying to calm her and contain her fear. Eventually, she told her father she needed to use the bathroom. Amjad was not convinced they'd allow access to a bathroom, but his daughter's crying was escalating, and he could tell she was in considerable discomfort. 
Amjad told Yuad that he had waved down a settler soldier, telling him, my daughter needs a bathroom. The soldiers ran towards him with their weapons raised. So Amjad said, I raised my hands towards the sky and shouted at them, she wants a bathroom, please let me pass. The settler soldiers yelled back, get back in your car, get back, get back in the car. Tell your daughter to piss herself in the car. All the while, his daughter continued to cry, Baba, Baba, I need a bathroom. Amjad got back in his car, hugged his daughter, and with a trembling voice told her, do it here, Baba. Do it quietly here in the car. He remembered how at that moment his daughter's screaming stopped as the smell of urine spread in the car. Amjad looked at his daughter and found her shedding silent tears. He hugged her as he drove them home. And as he looked at the checkpoint gate, he remembered the cheerful song of his daughter at the beginning of the day, bouncy, bouncy over the wall. We're not you, ball, he said, after which he felt a ball stuck in his throat. Yuad is willfully disobedient, as Sarah Ahmed would say, practicing from what Paul Preciado might say is a position of epistemological insubordination. The disobedience of a woman to become an agent of her own harm, as Ahmed reminds us. And while we know Yuad lives a life of willful validation of Palestinian selfhood, Palestinian womanhood, and in this case, Palestinian fatherhood in the face of brutal occupation, her willful disobedience vis-a-vis -vis her supervisor radiantly expresses willfulness as an act of affirming relationality as a willful act of affirming and standing with her patient Amjad. Disobedience, as Ahmed tells us, is never a singular, atomized, individualized act, but rather, quote, involves a chain of actions that need to be unbroken. A political action can be what is performed to stop a chain from breaking, end quote. Yad's willful disobedience is not only to say no, but in Ahmad's words, to repeat the no. For those who cannot, for those whom she has affirmed relationality of selfhood. Yad's decision is also an act of refusal. The act of refusal is a willful act, a positive act, and a productive act. A willful act that has become, according to Ahmad, a second skin. Yuad's affirmative willful disobedience is a tooling and deploying not only of psychoanalytic theory and practice, but also the ethics of care to Amjad's well-being. Yuad's decision is a decolonial feminist position, one that at once reclaims feminism in Virgis's words and realizes in its powerful simplicity quote, the way in which the complex of racism, sexism, and ethnocentrism pervades all relations of domination, end quote. In that moment of refusal, when she refuses to stop working with Amjad, she will not be an agent of the state or engage in carceral discipline of herself or Amjad, but rather she will commit again to being a radical decolonial feminist who's also a psychoanalytically informed care provider. Yad's decision to continue working with Amjad is exhilarating because it, because it is at once liberatory and liberating. She recognized his symptoms, not only the ball, but the loss of his language as a hajiz, a checkpoint. She refused to stop at that checkpoint, to stop at the occupying force or enforcer's command. Her recounting of the case, in fact, it was punctuated by articulations of willfulness. She said, I chose to continue treatment. She chose not to rely on medicating him alone and sending him back into an abnormal world of occupation, of settler colonialism with empty language, 
a world where checkpoints are called crossings, where fathers cannot protect their children, a world that does not confront the illegality of settler soldiers who stop the lives of thousands in service of settler colonial apartheid and who make a happy seven-year-old girl relieve herself in her favorite dress. Yad's act is a quiet revolutionary act, the act of refusal, which also is an act of autonomy, an autonomy, autonomy and sovereignty that is social and communal rather than focused solely on the individual or limited to the clinical dyad or the confines of the clinic. It's one that insists on indigenous presence in defiance of settler regimes, carceral logics, and their psychoanalytic proxies. Yad, as with all other clinician comrades in Palestine, in Palestine, highlight for us how their clinical work comes to be both a space for resistance for their patients and also an extension of their own resistance against settler colonial hegemony, a collective practice unified through precisely its engagement with creating and maintaining life and life worlds, as well as political and historical realities for Palestinians by Palestinians. Tahia Palestine, shukran. Thank you all. Well, thank you so much. Dr. Shihai, I'm sure if we were in a room together, there would be an explosion uh, of applause. This was such a powerful uh, talk, uh, such a moving story, um, such layered meanings, full of indigenous knowledge, um, and of course, resistance, willful resistance. And I'm sure that the audience is uh, at this point wanting to ask um, many questions and has many comments. So I really wanna remind people that please like use that energy, write us your comments and questions now. Um, we're keeping track of them. Uh, we're taking a look at them so that we can read them out in the Q&A. So if you have something you wanna say or a question that you wanna ask, um, just send a message to Priscilla McGreer. So in the direct message, you can kind of, there's like a drop down and Priscilla is the one uh, collecting those questions. Um, we have a lot more to say about uh, Dr. Shihai's talk, but first we're gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Talbear, who will be presenting her paper, Indigenous Genocide and Reanimation, Settler Apocalypse and Hope. Thanks, Tobias. Um, so I want to just repeat uh, Laura Sheehy's thanks to the organizers and to the interpreters. Um, and I just also want to say I'm, I still am often very surprised uh, when I'm asked to be in conversation with such diverse thinkers and and human beings. Um, and and it it's an honor, and I'm I'm also humbled. Um, so thank you um, for asking me to be here, and and thank you, Dr. Sheehy, for that uh, paper. I'm I was taking notes, and I'm still thinking about it. I hadn't read it before we got here, so I also have a lot to say. I'm looking forward to the conversation. So I'm just going to start my uh, stopwatch here, so I don't go over time. I'm only going to give the beginning of um, this talk. There are many more slides than uh, I will actually get to. Um, So I'm really only going to be talking about the indigenous genocide and reanimation aspect. And then the settler apocalypse and hope is something that comes later. And this is from a soon uh, to be published article in Aboriginal Policy Studies, which is published uh, out of the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta. So it, sh it should be out shortly in its longer form. So I gave a keynote uh, in October at the University of Southern California at a symposium called Mass Violence and its Lasting Impacts on Indigenous Peoples, the Case of the Americas and Australia Pacific Region. Talks at that symposium unflinchingly documented the systematic application of diverse UN-defined genocidal techniques on Indigenous peoples of the Americas and the Pacific. As a reminder, Article 2, uh, and I think we can move to the first uh, slide, by the way. I um, 
I'm not seeing the slides here or the second slide and go ahead and move to that one. Yeah, thank you very much. So as a reminder, Article 2 of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide defines uh, genocide as, quote, any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. And I think it's really important to revisit this definition because we get a lot of genocide denial in Canada and the United States and elsewhere in the world because it doesn't look like uh, the the a couple of few iconic incidents that are widely recognized as being such. And so genocide involves number one, literal killing. It involves causing serious bodily or mental harm, inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction, imposing measures intended to prevent births and forcibly transferring children to another group. These techniques focus on eliminating entire groups, while individuals from within a group may survive physically as individual human beings. Indigenous nations were targeted for extermination by a physical, social, economic, and regulatory engineering. A 19th century soundbite in the U.S. and Canada encapsulates the ability to simultaneously exterminate Native peoples as peoples, capital P, while facilitating the survival of a select and relatively few individuals who could then be assimilated in, by the settler body politic. And that soundbite was, kill the Indian and save the man. That USC symposium that I first gave an earlier iteration of this talk at discussed genocidal techniques used against Indigenous nations of the Americas that included massacres, the genocidal technique of forced sterilization of Indigenous women, seizure of our children, and missing and murdered Indigenous women. My research and media commentary of late and my talk at the USC Symposium focused on an aspect of the North American colonial project that has been undertreated as genocide. That is what you can call self-indigenization, also sometimes called race shifting or playing Indian. In this talk, I hope to convince you that self-indigenization is a significant contributor in the 21st century to the project of Indigenous elimination and concomitant settler thriving upon the spoils of literal Indigenous death. So I think we can go to the next slide. So in addition to be belonging to being from a Dakota people, uh, I'm Sistan Wapton Oyate. Uh, it's a Dakota nation in uh, what is now Eastern South Dakota. I don't know if that was in my bio. We faced a genocidal settler assault that began in the mid 19th century. Uh, in addition to being a Dakota, I'm also a horror film aficionado and I have a macabre sense of humor. So in this talk, I am informed by the concept of indigenous elimination, most notably written about by the late Patrick Wolfe in the Journal of Genocide Research. But I combine that with the idea of reanimation of the dead. A troubling image that guides my work is that of the settler who would banish most indigenous people to the land of the dead. And we see this in representations of the always vanishing and dead Indian of the past. But while they do that, they retain, freeze, reanimate, and control literally and figuratively indigenous flesh, blood, and bones as valuable bioproperty. And as I've written about in my book, Native American DNA and elsewhere. So adding to the ghoulishness of settler scientific and bureaucratic control, reanimation, and capitalization on our actual biomatter, our blood, our DNA, and the data derived from that, the settler sometimes drapes his, or often her, as we've seen in recent cases, ontological skeleton in the vanished metaphorical native skin in a final assumption of our identities, a word I don't like, as their own. This is very clever. Settler state citizens can then retain the benefits of our disappearance, but deny those benefits when they don our metaphorical red skin. Despite dressing or dressing up in Indian flesh and costume in order to emotionally and morally manage settler state complicity in indigenous genocide actually has 300 year old roots in settler law, politics, and self-understandings. In the book, Playing Indian, Philip Deloria, who is a historian and a member of a well-known Dakota family, traced the origins of dressing up and performing Indianness in the United States. His historical account began in the 18th century and it winds through the late 20th century as he recounts incidents of playing Indian from the Boston Tea Party, 
in scouting and fraternal rituals, and in romanticized literature that eventually informed anthropology. Finally, in that book, he discusses new age appropriation of indigenous spirituality that ramped up in the 1980s. Now, Deloria barely touched on false claims to native ancestry and identity, but his historical investigation provided us with an analytical scaffolding by which we can understand more literal forms of playing Indian, making false or ten tenuous claims to indigenous identity via alleged often distant ancestry. In 21st century acts of playing Indian, the players probably do not recognize their role in this dog-eared yet evolving nationalist script. Neither do the viewers out in the public necessarily understand the centuries-long national play that we are all watching. So I want us to sit for another minute with these clever settler nationalist maneuvers and their relatively deep historical foundations. In Playing Indian, Deloria quotes early 20th century British writer D.H. Lawrence's description of an essentially unfinished and incomplete American consciousness that produced, quote, an unparalleled national identity crisis. Lawrence saw the Indian as at the heart of American ambivalence. Savage Indians served Americans as oppositional figures against whom one might imagine a civilized national self. Coded as freedom, however, wild Indianness proved equally attractive, setting up a dialectic of simultaneous desire and repulsion. Deloria summarized, and I quote, the indeterminacy of American identity stems in part from the nation's inability to deal with Indian people. Americans wanted to feel natural affinity with the continent, and it was Indians who could teach them such Aboriginal closeness. Yet, in order to control the landscape, they had to destroy the original inhabitants. Half-articulated Indianness continually lurks behind various efforts at American self-imagination. According to settler state nationalist ideology, it is inevitable that indigenous peoples are always dying in the face of Western civilization, yet indigenous existence is crucial for US American and Canadian nationalist coherence and for the production of the multicultural citizen subject. This produces a conundrum for the settler colonial state but it has found a clever if convoluted solution. The settler state must bring indigenous peoples to the point of death while preserving or resurrecting us. Sorry, things are popping up on my, uh, on my desktop here. The settler state must bring indigenous peoples to the point of death while preserving or resurrecting us within the colonial state's nationalist body its institutions and in the bodies and lives of individual non-Indigenous citizens. Indigeneity must be made to live in the settler body politic, even while the settler nationalist project simultaneously narrates and works to produce Indigenous death. I just want to make sure I'm still on Zoom because my uh, desktop has reconfigured itself. You're good. We can see you and hear you. Great. Thank you. So the settler state has worked hard for centuries to make indigenous people die via massacre in the deathly conditions of forced relocations and in residential schools via forced sterilization and by the theft of our children, both historically and ongoing today. It continues to subject our peoples to explicit physical violence of police profiling and disproportionate incarceration. We have so many missing and murdered indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit relatives that there is an acronym for this phenomenon. Settler society also works actively to counter living indigenous communities' efforts to sustain our own lives by violating treaties and diminishing laws that are more rather than less protective of our sovereignty, thus enabling them to continue stealing our land and our children. Simultaneously, multiple tactics are used within scientific and government institutions to make indigeneity live within the settler body. As I wrote about in Native American DNA, indigenous blood, bones, and DNA are disembodied from collective indigenous governance by settler legal and disciplinary traditions, then used as a proxy 
for the indigenous collectives and lives that colonial agents would disappear. The settler disingenuously laments that indigenous death is so far along that it is inevitable and ethical to appropriate and reanimate in their own bodies and institutions, remaining indigenous biological and cultural resources. Gaining control over our biological resources and the laws and narratives governing those resources and their meanings enable the playing Indian process as well as appropriative identity claims. Let's go to the next slide. So the visual on this slide, uh, eight stages of white settler colonial denial, shows the phenomenon of self-indigenization as a final act of colonial theft and an, att an attempt at indigenous replacement. So I originally saw this eight stages visual posted in 2020 by a now deleted Twitter Twitter account. And I think I've got the uh, original link at the bottom of this slide. I never knew who the account holder was, but the eight stages, I've shared it with a lot of people and it's resonated with other researchers schooled across multiple disciplines, history, anti-colonial uh, anti political theory, indigenous law, native studies and other fields. I use the eight stages visual to remind myself and others of how interconnected are the techniques of the white supremacist settler state and its citizens, not all of whom are white, uh, designed to eliminate indigenous, uh, actual indigenous people. We can readily see where UN described genocidal techniques intersect with the eight stages of denial. 19th century physical exterminations through massacres and bounties were justified by concepts such as the great chain of being and the doctrine of discovery, which place indigenous peoples lower in the hierarchy of life on this planet. Outright physical extermination justifies and is justified by terra nullius and the right of conquest. Forced sterilizations of especially indigenous women and the forcible removal of children from indigenous families and collectives, whether through adoption, state custody, or incarceration in residential schools is also justified by racial hierarchy thinking facilitated by the great chain of being concept that is foundational, not only to settler colonial religious thought, but also to its scientific and bureaucratic thought. Efforts to extinguish indigenous languages, kinship and governance systems, and gender and sexual relations are also rooted in race hierarchy thinking. All of these historical and ongoing assaults on our individual lives and collective indigenous nations are justified and barely redressed by settler legal systems founded on these core principles. Settler societies advocate moving on or getting over it while pursuing yet further extinguishment of indigenous collective governance as they water down indigenous claims with their liberal multiculturalist doctrines. So I want to note now and emphasize that uh, techniques of Indigenous elimination should not be ranked, but rather they are co-constitutive. So it's all too common for attention police to rank Indigenous elimination techniques in a hierarchy of importance instead of understanding them as co-constitutive, as simultaneously occurring to varying degrees over time and space. Attention police accuse thinkers focused in one area of distracting from another area, for example, why are you focused on representations of Indigenous people in media or sports when we have an epidemic of missing and murdered Indigenous women? However, strategies of Indigenous physical and symbolic extermination come all together in a package and are mutually reinforcing. It takes diversely situated activists and other experts focused in their particular areas to tackle the many diverse techniques of elimination that we are encountering. We will be aided in our collective resistance by understanding the clever entanglements of the settler state's eliminatory and reanimating strategies and the equally clever way in which individual citizens aid the project, whether they know it consciously or not. We as individuals, organizations, and movements can focus in the areas where we are drawn and most qualified to address. We can do that without dismissing the attentions of other thinkers and doers. We can be mindful of each other's work, learning from each other about how our priorities and skills are complementary. 
Now, I admit that I have a particularly good vantage point from which to observe the varied topographies of Indigenous elimination over time and place, having experienced diverse strategies of elimination in my now five plus decades of life. I've lived through both explicit reservation border town anti-Native violence and the fetishization and erasure of Native people as actually living communities when I have lived in East and West Coast metropolitan centers. So I no longer rank these forms of elimination, but I understand them as mutually reinforcing and as tools available to the settler state, depending on local in time and place circumstances. The settler state can kill us quickly and harshly, or it can kill us slowly over time. We must respond accordingly with diverse defensive and counteroffensive strategies along their multiple lines of attack. Now, I did not set out to study this phenomenon or of playing Indian, or as it's sometimes called, pretendianism. Some people think that second word is sounds too playful, although they both sound playful. So I didn't set out to study this as a focus of my research, but the media frequently call on me and have since 2012, when I first commented on Senator Elizabeth Warren's mythological Cherokee identity claims. My book, Native American DNA, was finished and in press in 2012. It came out in 2013. So by this point, I've done dozens, probably hundreds of interviews for print, radio, and television on various Native race-shifting cases that include politicians, academics, actors, film directors, in both the U.S. and Canada. So I follow these stories closely for a decade now. In October 2022, we witnessed breaking stories about three high-profile cases of self-indigenization in the U.S. and Canada. Many of you on uh, this Zoom uh, meeting will be familiar with those cases, including uh, most recently the premier of Alberta, Danielle Smith's unsupportable claims to being quote-unquote mixed race and descended from the Cherokee Nation. Those who reject or downplay self-indigenization as a significant technique of indigenous elimination may not be aware of its deep history. They may not know, as Deloria has documented, that playing Indian in various forms has been a tactic to assert belonging in these lands, that it began with early colonists in the 18th century. They may not know, as anthropologist Circe Sturm shows in her 2011 book, Becoming Indian, that there are dozens of fabricated Cherokee tribes in the U.S. Many non-Indigenous and Indigenous people, too, seem not to grasp that playing Indian is co-produced with these more obvious techniques of Indigenous elimination, such as the alienation of Indigenous peoples from our lands, children, ceremonial practices, governance systems, and kinship structures. Native children, human remains, and cultural patrimony, educational and professional uh, opportunities. In addition to the high-profile race-shifting cases of late, uh, in both academia and the arts, a 2019 LA Times investigative report documented false claimants to Cherokee identity being awarded hundreds of millions of dollars in business contracts that were designed to support minority businesses systematically excluded from business development opportunities. In such cases, white people have been appropriating opportunities and wealth, not only from Native nations and their citizens, but from other people of color as well. Let's go to the next slide. I just, uh, I might go a minute or two over time. I want to talk uh, on the next slide about some uh, narrative, oh, there's just a photograph there. I like photographs. They illustrate these kinds of big ideas. Um, some narrative strategies of self-indigenizers. So I want to talk about what their responses are and why those are problematic. When prominent self-indigenizers, who are most often white people, are challenged on their claims, uh, tribal blood quantum rules are often blamed, and accusations of biological essentialism or reverse racism abound. This is an ironic accusation from people who customarily point to one long ago actual or mythological ancestor, uh, the Indian needle in their settler haystack. Blood quantum rules are not at play in these situations. The individuals who make such claims are not excluded from any form of tribal belonging by blood rules but rather because their claims to ancestry are either baseless or so archaic that they don't map onto actual living and indigenous nations. Their situations are nothing like the exclusion some of our relatives suffer for not meeting blood quantum rules of tribes within which they already have close biological kin. 
However, stealing actual Indigenous people's stories of trauma and disconnection is a chief strategy that self-Indigenizers use to gain authority. They conflate their exaggerated and fabricated claims with the struggles of actual Indigenous people, such as those with parents who are tribal citizens but whose offspring do not meet blood quantum requirements. Self-Indigenizers conflate their stories with those of actual Indigenous people who were kidnapped as children adopted out to white families or forced into residential schools and who sometimes did not return to their indigenous families for decades, if ever. Self-indigenizers build their authoritative voices by grabbing the mic and speaking from false historical foundations about actual indigenous people's lives and what should be done to and about us. Another strategy of self-indigenizers uh, that they use to boost their authority is to claim to be less colonized and sometimes more culturally authentic than actual indigenous people and communities. Race shifters commonly claim that they and their ancestors have been Indians in hiding for generations, a sort of Indian preserve stored in a hidden cellar away from the eroding forces of the colonial state. It is true that Indigenous people have been forced to reckon daily for generations with settler state racial laws, policies, and institutions. Instead of preserving authentic Indianness, however, the race shifter, with the very long ago or mythological ancestor, has most often lived as white for generations, with all of the attendant privileges and lack of exposure to institutions meant to kill the Indian. Romanticized narratives of hiding in plain sight are used by race shifters to discredit and further dislocate Indigenous collectives from the landscape of the living, whereas actual Indigenous collectives who have managed to survive these vicious colonial nation states must articulate our relational rules and laws as best we can within the compromised spaces available to us. Race shifters in good colonizer fashion denigrate our efforts as they seek to replace us as indigenous upon the land. So self-indigenization is an ultimate act of colonial appropriation, whether self-indigenizers intend it or not. Self-indigenization co-evolves with recognized genocidal strategies. It is predicated on 200 years of racial science across disciplines co-constituted with settler state laws and policies designed to kill the Indian within the human. Individuals may survive but actual Indigenous collectives must remain conquered, controlled, and sufficiently alive only to provide the bio or cultural matter necessary for the vampiric thriving of a settler state. And the rest of this paper uh, is about why Indigenous collectives, not just some kind of notion of individual claims or ancestry, why collectives must survive because they will help all of us on this planet live. And I go through indigenous environmental uh, or land defender and water defender movements. And I talk about why those collective bodies are um, embodying ways of knowing and ways of relating with the planet that will help ensure the survival of all of us. And so the rest of the talk turns towards environmental concerns, climate concerns, concerns about the Anthropocene, and then talks about uh, the sort of hostile joy, a colleague of mine has said, that I take in the notion of a settler apocalypse and then what kind of hope we have beyond that. So I will stop there and then we can talk. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Well, again, applause um, all around. Thank you for sharing uh, this really rich, uh, important, and just clearly very thought-provoking work. Um, I'm sure that I speak for many people here saying that I feel really lucky to get this preview of your upcoming publication. Um, and you've given us like so much to consider, both of you. And, uh, you know, I feel like you, you know, what you've both presented has such interesting, uh, places of overlap. And we've scheduled the rest of our time for that conversation. Um, I'll do my, other, you know, my reminder again that we would love for the audience to uh, participate with comments and questions. So um, please do reach out to Priscilla McCreer in the chat. Um, you know, take your time writing them out and we'll go through them and uh, make sure to uh, deliver them to the speakers. 
But to get us started, the J-Series um, has put together a few questions that I've been you know, struggling to pick from as uh, I was listening to you talk. We kind of switched it up a little bit. So, um, and I'll say too that, you know, these questions really come out of conversation uh, through the J-Series. So I'm, you know, Nina, Nina and I are going to be sharing them, but um, they're really from all of us. So I'll start off with a question on identity and feel free to draw from any part of this, go in any direction. So I'm wondering if you uh, would both be able to talk more about the tensions and differences between relationality and identity in the work that you presented today. Uh, so Dr. Shihai, you speak about the importance of Palestinians uh, Palestinian clinicians work with Palestinian clients, and also about the chokeholds like Amjad's fear of losing the identity card, identity card um, in quotations, that allowed him to live and work in Jerusalem. And I know that uh, relationality takes on unique meanings in a psychoanalytic context, and um, that claims to certain identities are also consistently undermined within psychoanalysis. And you kind of point to that too in several ways, one of which is uh, opening with Preciado's call to psychoanalysts. And Dr. Talbert, you've written extensively on the concept of relations over identity. And you articulate that identity acts as a really poor substitute for indigenous kinship and relations. And you suggest that identity doesn't encapsulate ongoing relating to one another but rather you point to it as a kind of relationship to property. So, and clearly too, in the case of pretendians, uh, indig indigenous identity is being manipulated and appropri appropriated for settler gain. So is there meaningful overlap between identity and relationality at all for you two? Um, how do we pay closer attention to these colonial entanglements of identity, otherness, and nation? Just a small question. I mean, I prefer that Lara start because I would I hadn't because uh, I don't know if I can how to answer the question beyond what you've how you've already encapsulated what I've said, and I was really interested in that identity card. I was thinking, well, yeah, no. So I've started. I don't want to start. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for giving us a softball. <laughs> to focus. Um, I suppose, it go, you know, thanks, Kim, for for your talk. And, you know, I'm taking notes as well. And you you could be speaking about Palestine, right, which is precisely what we're because we're talking about the logics of settler colonialism, where where it happens. So I, that's my entry point to bias to this is that in shorthand, I will say I have yet to meet. <clears throat> I'll speak about Palestinians. I have yet to meet Palestinians who are confused about their identity as Palestinians, except as mediated through settler colonial logics that actually are uh, deployed in a particular way to scramble psychically in the ways that Kim was was sort of listing out, right? To make, or and, and of course, Patrick Wolf, right? Making the settler indigenous. So this idea of identity is really becomes really important for the settler colonial state and its logics rather than the, for in, indigeneity. Of course, it becomes a way in which indigenous folks then might coalesce historic claims, the way they talk about. In the context of Palestine, identity is super important because depending on geographically, if we're thinking about Palestine from the river to the sea, which that is all of Palestine. When we look at a map, Palestine is all Palestine with a settler colonial overlay over top of it, identity becomes very important in as much as who has rights based on particular identities that are narrated by settler colonial re regime of partition, right? So we can look at part of the work that we did is that Palestine is a unified Palestine. Palestinians are unified in their fight against settler colonial apartheid, and yet there are settler colonial mechanisms that insist on contours of identity that respond to settler colonial logics, 
rather than indigenous logics. What instead we see, as maybe perhaps in other spaces, what emerges, the relationality of what does it mean to be from a particular place in Palestine? What does it mean in terms of oral traditions? What does it mean in terms of the tatris that one wears, right? The patterns on people's clothes. What does it mean in terms of your uh, proximity to the sea or being inland? Or And so all of those are also land based. What does it mean in terms of traditions? But also what does it mean in the context of Palestine that has seen since 1948, a series of violent policies that accumulate displacement. So you have internal refugees, you have 700,000 plus people who are expelled and displaced who can never go back to Palestine. That is where identity then emerges is really important. And I think that's where the relationality, what comes in and out of salience as being important, perhaps is also in what we position it in relationality to. For me, for clinicians, I suppose that's the most important thing for me is the questioning and what Kim's sort of talk really helped me again uh, distill is what are the ways in which we might actually be conscripted into stabilizing settler colonial logics, where you are actually um, positioning settler colonial logics of identity over indigenous, right? What is salient for the indigenous person? What is in salient for Palestinians? What is it, where does our psychic energy go? So in, in the talk that I gave, a lot of clinicians will go to, well, how did, you know, the Palestinian clinician end up defying the ethics of our care. Well, the point is under settler colonial regimes, the ethics of our care that say you must be under supervision are dictated by settler colonial regime in which that Palestinian is under supervision by a settler colonial subject, right? By her own colonizer. So that, that identity vis-a-vis -vis supervisor and supervisee and then patient and su supervisor and then patient and clinician the relationality changes immediately when we sort of reconfigure that way. So to understand all of these as outposts of settler colony, kind of like what Kim was saying, is like we need to look at how the mechanics of this are happening and how institutions sometimes also disappear those mechanics on purpose, right? And I think that's where I would commute between identity when identity becomes important and then when relationality needs to be at the forefront. Um, yeah, I'm, this is so, this is so fascinating, never having been exposed, uh, to Lara's work before. And I don't, I didn't take any classes in psychoanalysis in grad school. So this is really interesting to me. Um, yeah, I was thinking, uh, Lara, as you were, as you were talking, um, that I, and I think I've said this in various ways before. I mean, when I, I often ask especially in other indigenous people, when you're tempted to use the word identity, when we're talking about all of the things that we're concerned about, try to figure out what you really mean. Is there another word that's better than that word? I mean, I like to, to ask people to do a thought experiment. I understand that's the easy word to put, pull off the shelf and that we may know in this deep and nuanced way, all the relationships that we're talking about when we talk about that, both between humans, among humans and non-humans. But that's not necessarily what that word means in a in settler thought. And so I think we should get more careful and more precise about the way that we speak about this. And it might mean that instead of one word, it's going to take us six or seven sentences to say what we mean. But I would really encourage us to not use that word as much as we cannot use that word when what we're actually talking about are relationships with place. I think that word identity severs us from the place and the land. It can indicate us as being sort of human islands. Um, uh, it, it's, it might be too internal. It's property. It's about my, 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 not uh, who and what am I in relationship with? Who and what do I belong to? Um, and so I think then it, it also allows the settler state to act like displays of multicultural inclusion are enough. When that's not enough, we're actually asking for things back, which which Laura was talking about, right? And identity doesn't quite get at that because then you get into all of their 
their narratives that they've sort of used to script the agenda. Uh, you know, their multiculturalist narratives that would put on put on us these kinds of ideas. You're seeking special treatment because of your identity. Actually, no, we're seeking for return of what was stolen and what and what you continue to capitalize off of, right? So anyway, we could talk about this all, all day. I don't like the word and I challenge you not to use it as much as possible. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Nina, I think you uh, have a question. Yes. I just want to say, I challenge you not to use it in relationship to Indigenous stuff. I don't I don't work in other areas. So just to make that clear. Oh, yeah. I, I wish we could discuss this a little bit more, but unfortunately, we don't have too much time. So I'm going to share the another question uh, that we came up as a group. Um, so metaphor is pow powerfully evoked in both of your papers, albeit in a very different ways. Dr. Tolbert turns to horror films and the reanimation of the dead, a zombiesque manipulation of the flesh, which illuminates the ultimate settler appropriation. And Dr. Shihai, uh, you think with Amjad's ball in the throat, which stands in for many things, including suffocation, checkpoints, hate for the self, uh, daughter's joy, uh, and traumatic moment. Could you both speak more to how metaphor might be a helpful intervention in upsetting settler colonial logic and structures? And perhaps further, could you discuss how your work disrupts settler metaphors of property and identity as a way of building resistance? And also, there is the additional part, but I don't think that we have time for that, so I'll stop here. Um, I don't, I don't know that I have much to say about metaphor. I mean, obviously I use it. What I, what I'm trying to do is, um, both have fun. I don't use the word play very much. I don't play. I'm very serious even when I have fun and play to me doesn't seem serious, but I don't know. <laughs> That's another conversation. I just like to make fun of white people. And I think it's really important to make fun, right? It's very important, uh, to, to turn the gaze back on them, to show how what they do is weird. Uh, how, you know, all the strangeness. I mean, I'm an anthropologist of white people. And so part of how I can do that in a way that I think brings a more, a clearer vision to, to the critique is to is to do use things like zombies. You know, I like horror movies. I love it. And it's like all that I watch, uh, you know, and, and, and also... Uh, it satisfies the the macabreness. Uh, you know, you have to have a macabre sense of humor when you're coming out of a um, a, a background like like what Dakota people have suffered. So, um, yeah, what I, I view what I'm doing is as, as as making fun and having a little bit of laughter and fun myself doing it, whether other people are having fun or not. What's most important to me is that I'm having fun, and then I'm also getting my my message across more clearly to people who might find these things confusing because they are confusing. Over to you, Lara. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, Kim, I think you're an organic psychoanalyst. <laughs> And that's because we're 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 sort of seizing the contours of what psychoanalysts mean and, and refusing settler colonial, you know, context of, of what that means. And doesn't happen in institutions, it happens in this sort of affective knowledge. And to that, I would say that, you know, uh, it's not a metaphor. And of course, here I can't but think of, of course, of Tuck and Yang, right? Decolonization is not a metaphor, but Palestine is also not a metaphor. And so when Amjad feels the ball that is indigenous knowledge. It's indigenous knowledge of what's being forced down his throat because when he passes through a checkpoint, he knows, right? Checkpoints now, if you go into the state now known as Israel, what they've been doing to revamp these checkpoints, which are unnatural, but become natural fixture, fixtures of settler colonialism, a settler colonial regime, is making it look like airport terminals, right? That's another, so they use they rely on our imagination and metaphor to erase the violence that's done in the name of settler colonial borders, right? What the indigenous does is have access to symptoms that cannot be erased. You will not erase the knowledge that this is an unnatural process. And so that ball is in my throat. It's stopped up. Like Amjad tells us, it's not, it's not a crossing. It's a checkpoint. It's a checkpoint right? 
So for me, it really, I get a little weary when we start going into the world of metaphor, not because I don't like metaphor, like Ken was saying, but because metaphor has been used so insidiously by liberal humanism, right? And it stops there oftentimes. It's like, oh, we're talking about, no, we're actually talking about settler colonial apartheid regime that sets up checkpoints and doesn't allow a seven-year-old to have fun, right? To see her friend. And by the way, there's a checkpoint. Like that is our starting point. That shouldn't be there anyway. So I, I, I really want us to go back to the concrete. And there's something really important about what lives in the concrete and not as a displacement into metaphor. Because my worry is that when we talk in those ways only, we do forget the warnings that Kim was telling us the, and, this, and how it's happening in real time, right? We see this a lot, by the way, happening in the context of the settler state of the United States. Anytime you have fascist police in the street, the, you see them reach to this looks like Kabul, this looks like Iraq. It's like, dude, it's happening here. It's right in front of you. So that's why I would say, I would be invite us also to be like, when are we speaking in metaphor and when are we talking concretely? about white supremacist, settler colonial, or fascist policies that are happening in front of us? And what are the ways in which we might be conscripted into moves to innocence when we talk about those things as metaphor rather than as literal things that are happening? Symptoms for folks in Palestine are a part of that. I don't see them as, there, there, there are modes of communication indigenous knowledge of what is happening to the body and what is being displaced and what is being disavowed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Dr. Kimber. This was, this was perfect. Tobias, over to you. Yeah, so we definitely have some questions and comments from the audience. I think uh, Suzanne and Priscilla are taking a look at that, so I'll pass it over to them. Okay, so yes, we had, of course, several questions. So uh, we um, had to just pick a few. Um, our first question comes from, let's see, Ram Arama. Um, or no, sorry, we'll start with uh, Melissa Scott, I think, Suzanne. Um, so Arama, <laughs> okay. Um, so her question to our speakers is, um, there is a tendency for here for non-Indigenous people to uh, learn the Maori language. Um, she's from Aor, uh, Aor Tierra. Um, there are even calls to make uh, their language compulsory in all schools. And this is promoted as helping their language survive. However, non-Indigenous people who have the resources uh, to learn their language uh, when, when many of their own people do not also gain massive social cultural capital from uh, proficiency in their language. Um, however, their language is one of the few markers of their distinctiveness. Um, so if everyone spoke Maori, there would be less to define them as a people. Uh, she is wondering what your thoughts about this um, is as a form of eliminating natives. I haven't thought very much about this, but I notice that when I go to when I go to New Zealand, um, the way that Maori has been incorporated into like statecraft, right, um, and uh, and into the kind of iconography of the country and you know I, I haven't asked my Maori friends what what they think of that I imagine and I've heard uh you know language revitalization people like Lakota and Dakota people talk about this same predicament that you've got non uh native people learning our our languages and many of our own people don't have access to to the the kinds of time and uh resources that they would need to do that and their lives are not i mean their lives are all they've got a lot of other challenges but i i don't um i'm kind of with the questioner there i i it is a predicament and i'm not sure what to do about it um i don't know laura if you have any thoughts on that yeah um 
if nothing else, I, I love the question because it's, and, and perhaps this is the clinician in me, I'm listening to the misattunement that it is, that it's raising, right? That as, even as you try and focus, and perhaps this is what you came more talking about, like these multicultural, um, you know, interventions that people make, you, you have so much money to throw at certain things. And most of us who have been systemically sort of eliminated or, or, uh, or aggressed upon end up thinking, that, yeah, but we actually didn't want that. <laughs> like that we're, we're telling you specifically what we want and somehow that is never attended to. And that's what I mean by misattunement. And so first of all, I think that is an important um, internal process to pay attention to. When, when something feels misattuned, it probably is because settler colonialism like ideology because it is an ideology contains contradictions and so in some ways it looks like wow look how expansive we're being but in that expansion is there also erasure and I and I am hearing that in that question and I think it's an attuned and intuitive process um we were recently my partner and I were recently in South Africa and we were having this exact same conversation about how fellows coming to South Africa are uh get money to study right Zulu or Zosa and oftentimes um, that will be prioritized at the same time that this, those same folks have a lack of access to uh, services from the state. And so is it sort of lip service around what is actually needed to sustain indigenous life, right? So not really an answer, but also an uplifting of saying, these are the sorts, for me, these are the sorts of questions that disrupt colonial logics, because for me, a settler colonial state, and I've learned this from the state now known as Israel, is there is nothing that they're more invested in than legitimacy. There's nothing they're more invested in than being seen as good, as democratic, as liberal, as expansive, right? And so if we're starting to sense that some of these interventions go along those lines and the people who actually uh, really pay attention to and would would benefit from these services that are not getting them it might be a clue to us about from where they're emerging right like where where the what the texture of that is and it, and it might be another move one of those moves to innocence that you were you were talking about wow well, we've feel very disappointed uh, on the side here where we want to ask you many more questions. Um, I guess, do you have any final words, anything that you feel like we haven't covered or you want to say before we close out? I just wanted to say that I've been struck as, as I always am, but listening to Laura's talk and the things we've been talking about, about how we we work within the institutions that we, I, and I struggle to find a verb, I don't want to use the word given, that we've been allowed, right? That we're allowed entry to, that have been constructed on Indigenous land. We we work within these institutions. I was thinking about the the, the psychoanalyst, right? The What's the, the appropriate word? Therapist? I'm not sure what the appropriate word is. <laughs> um, working within this really restrictive institution, and we as academics do that. So it doesn't matter what institution you're in, pretty much. Um, uh, you work within those parameters, um, and just the, the the contradictions of working in this thoroughly colonial institution, no matter how good and multicultural and liberal it tries to be, that's not ultimately the solution, but we're working with what we have. Um, that's just been coming up a lot. Yeah. That's not very profound, but... <laughs> Though it, it it is because I think for me those are the contradictions, right? That and the, and maybe this goes back to Tobias, this idea about this is where relationality is really important. What your you what your work has taught me around the collective is why the collective needs to survive. Because for me also, there's so many seductions within settler colonialism and within the very rich and long-standing stories and narratives that settlers tell to each other. I don't think there's a uh I don't think it's a surprise why the settler state of Canada and the settler state of the United States finds a great ally in the settler state of Israel, right? They see each other, they know what's happening, and then there are seductions to sort of tell us a different narrative, right? We see this now happening where uh, Zionists will say that they are indigenous to Palestine, and that has become part of part of the 
the aspect of it. So what you're saying to me is actually really important because if I situate sort of concentric circles of this, that is why it becomes important for us to have these conversations, to, to speak the no that Yad was saying, to refuse that seduction, to refuse these logics, to be like, no, actually, we, we, know, the, we know the narrative <laughs> and we will continue to tell it over and over and over again as, as a way of disrupting um, settler colonial hegemony. Well, I think that's a beautiful place to end. I want to thank you both, uh, Dr. Tolbert and Shihai, for sharing, honestly, such deep, profound knowledge and really opening a space um, for collectivity here today uh, with all of us. So much appreciation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. Oh, really thank you. I've, I've learned a lot. I look forward to looking at more of your work. Thank you. Me too. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.